All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today's seminar speaker is Alexei Kritzo from the University of California, San Diego. Um, he started his academic career in Leningrad, where you obtained your PhD, I believe. Uh, a long, a long time ago. <laughs> and then, um, uh, also spent some time at the Max Planck Institutes, from what I understand, uh, before moving to uh, UCSD, where he's been for the past 18 years or so. Um, there's a wide variety of American simulations of turbulence and, and turbulence in many different contexts, and I hope you hear about a lot of that today. Go ahead. Okay. So thank you for the invitation and for nice introductions. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. I've never been in Toronto before. Um, I would like to talk today about uh, some turbulence uh, problems related to astrophysics, star formation in particular. And uh, I think the title is a little bit too generic. I would say probably aspects of fluid dynamics or because it's an enormous subject, of course. Um, OK, so um, with that being said, let's uh, move on to the outline. So I would like to start with a little bit of history, which uh, we don't want to miss because we want to understand how did we get here uh, in, in, uh, in, in interstellar turbulence. And that uh, would explain uh, what do we know and what we don't know right now, OK, I hope. Then I will sh uh, talk a little bit about different sorts of uh, multi-phase models for the ISM, which helps us to understand how molecular clouds form, how they live, and how stars form in molecular clouds. And then I would uh, switch to a little subject related to CMB foregrounds, which may be of interest to some of you <coughs> here, uh, which came up uh, pretty recently. So uh, we were looking at uh, opportunities to use old models that we computed to understand C and B modes in uh, galactic foregrounds due to thermal dust. <clears throat> okay, and then I will give some perspective on numerics if I have time at the end. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, begin with history. And I think this subject uh, was born in, in this three groundbreaking symposia where astrophysicists uh, got in contact with aerodynamicists. So this is International Astronomical Union and International Union of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics, golden time. We didn't know much about the ISM back then, uh, not we, they, OK? Um, but it was clear that uh, astro people need help from real professional people doing fluid dynamics. And I think we are still missing some of that. So as you see, the attendance, so there were three symposia. One was in Paris, uh, 49, and then Cambridge, 53, and then uh, in other Cambridge, 57. And you see that the, the group of people, uh, which is uh, just a part of it, of course, these are all famous uh, scientists, right? Chandrasekhar, Field, Gold, uh, Hoyle, Lindblad, Ort. Ort was uh, organizing, and he was helped by uh, Hank Wanderhulst. And we are celebrating centennial of Hank this year, and there will be a conference. Uh, I had a pleasure to meet him in Leningrad in the 90s. I helped him to go to Nevsky Prospect, see some architectural pieces, and then we went to a bookstore to buy a book for his uh, grandson. And you know, Russian culture is different, so we have fairy tales, basically. And he was looking for something like Bob the Builder thing in Russian, and we just don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, um, so there was an interesting moment, because uh, 1949 is when turbulence uh, was on very high demand. It just. Uh, it happened that uh, one of the Arctic convoys returning from Murmansk to UK uh, brought a lot of uh, bounded copies of English translation of uh, Daklade of Acad Academy of Science of USSR. Okay, and that's, uh, that batch of books went into library in Cambridge 
and that's where Bachelor, the young postdoc uh, Bachelor, was uh, <clears throat> scanning the shells, and he bumped into the uh, famous articles by Kolmogorov, 1941. Okay, so that's how it works. And then there was excitement in the West about it, and uh, astro people uh, were thinking that, hey, maybe this is what uh, we want to use to explain the most recent observations. Uh, that's why this symposia were organized, essentially. And so the first one, and they didn't know yet about uh, Landau 44, which is actually Landau 42 remark that, okay, guys, there is intermittency and the scaling is not like that. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so that's why there was excitement. And so this group basically uh, started to discuss uh, questions. So whether we see clouds in the sky or this is turbulence. And so the, the Paris 49 meeting was all about this most of the time. And there was no consensus. So uh, these two guys were uh, saying that it's all turbulence. And it happens on galactic scale. And the, the, the clouds that we see are just part of this cascade process. And that's uh, like, like uh, it is in the incompressible flow. And the other group was more pragmatic, I think. And they said the key process of formation, formation of cloud is gravitation. And it's a completely different. So these are kind of quasi-hydrostatic self-gravitating entities. And we have to treat them uh, differently. And so, of course, um, <clears throat> both groups were correct in a sense. And there was no consensus. Then these people, von Neumann, um, uh, Hoyle, uh, von Karman, and Hans Lippmann from uh, Caltech, uh, they managed to get Heisenberg on their side. And so von Weizsäcker was the only one who allowed himself to stay firm on this. And they were very, fi uh, very strong fights between this guy and that guy. It's all documented. It's interesting to read, actually. OK, so, so uh, after these discussions, uh, because the, the consensus was, was that clouds are hydrostatic, uh, people were still complaining. And so you can read this in a bachelor's remark. I have never been clear about the explanation of discreteness of the cloud. I do not see how any theory of turbulent motions of high intensity can lead to the view that there would be separate clouds of high density proceeding more or less independently of, of each other, right? So the fluid people didn't understand this. But as astrophysicists, we know that we model collisions of clouds, right? And we enjoy the shocks and everything that happens afterward. <coughs> So this is what we do, but they don't understand why. OK? And so then Van de Hulst was uh, on top of everything here. And he, he was saying later, what is a cloud? The obvious answer is uh, the region of locally increased density. But this doesn't tell us much about the physics. So where is physics? How do clouds form? And, uh, and therefore, there is, uh, you know, sometimes we say turbulence within the clouds or turbulence outside the clouds, right? And, and, and this is an old thing. This is not, there is nothing new in that. 1949. OK, so, uh, so the consensus view basically resulted in uh, new models and new paradigms were developed eventually. And so we end up with, ended up with multi-phase ISM picture, which uh, resembles uh, clouds in equilibrium and pressure equilibrium with surroundings. And, and this is a shock front uh, that just disturbs the clouds, but does not generate turbulence, apparently. So turbulence was completely moved out of the view. And it was allowed in the 80s only as a micro turbulence in molecular clouds. That's, that, that was the result of those three meetings. OK. And because the ISM was not so dynamic, the, the theories of star formation that were subsequently built uh, were based on this assumption of uh, quasi-staticity of the whole picture, right? So you get, you get your molecular cloud, 
there are, there are some cores in it, and these cores start to slowly but surely move into a collapsed state and then produce stars. Okay. So now, in the recent years, we started to get back to, to, to turbulence to larger and larger scales. And I think right now we are somewhere at the disk, disk scale height. And we, we will probably move further to, to, to galactic scales, as predicted by uh, von Weizsäcker. <coughs> okay. So, um, and there is, uh, I'm, I mean, this whole story makes sense to me because we didn't know how to deal with this compressible turbulence. It's uh, highly compressible, it's non-homogeneous, it's uh, not isotropic. So, so in the recent years, there was some progress, and there were basically two different uh, directions developed in uh, understanding of compressible turbulence. So one group was applying uh, point splitting methods. Uh, so this is all about correlation functions and power spectra. The other group was pursuing the same goal of deriving similar uh, exact relations similar to Kolmogorov's uh, for fifth law using coarse graining and uh, uh, far averaging, okay? So, uh, so this is the product. It's very difficult, uh, but you can do it. And so right now I think we have pretty good understanding of what is going on in at least for um, either thermal compressible turbulence, right? And that includes also gravity. So we can actually operate with exact statistical relationships uh, which would help us to actually replace the virial theorem that we routinely apply to, to this analysis. So, um, so this is the uh, exact relation for self-gravitating either thermal turbulence. And so uh, J is just the momentum. Theta is divergence of the velocity. Uh, e is sort of free um, <coughs> energy. Uh, this is potential energy of compression in the either thermal gas. And so you can see that uh, there, are, there are three lines in this relationship. It's much longer than Kolmogorov's original result for incompressible flows. But don't be scared because uh, if, you, if you put this to zero, many of the terms will disappear, right? Uh, and then if, if density is constant, then uh, everything that includes E is zero as well. And so you end up with this uh, um, primitive form of the Kolmogorov's for fifth law. Um, delta means uh, these are differences. And so these are different velocity structure functions of the third order. And uh, there is a simple correspondence between the energy injection rate, epsilon, the scale R and, and this uh, combination, uh, this structure, mi mixed structure function. So what compressibility adds, uh, when uh, Mach numbers are high, uh, the variations of uh, pressure do not play any role compared to the velocity fluctuations and momentum. And so you end up with a form which is approximately replaces this huge thing if you ignore gravity, right? Which is very similar actually to, to the original Kolmogorov's result. All you need to do is you need to replace one of the delta U's uh, with uh, delta J, which is momentum, okay? So, and this trivial result helps you to see what happens in uh, uh, highly compressible turbulence, for example, that the scaling that you get here, if you ignore intermittency for a while, for the moment, um, would not depend on how you actually inject the energy into the system. It would only depend on the rate of energy injection. Okay, so this is a constant. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so you can take this and you can derive uh, uh, from first principles, uh, Larson's laws. Uh, and so that, that is uh, an opportunity to explain them without uh, invoking gravity. Okay, so, so let's now look at the uh, big picture of uh, how do we model star formation in this system. So you have a galactic disk, and from Herschel we know that uh, 
Uh, there is a lot of filamentary structures, but there are no clouds. It's very hard to find clouds per se, right? It's, it's a complicated structure, which looks more like turbulence than the clouds. And so observers have clouds as objects to, to measure something. But in theory, we better talk about turbulence uh, <clears throat> than about clouds. And this is for a reason, because it's hard to find out where the boundaries of the cloud is. Are right, and so and actually, uh, this cloud is always receiving energy coming from larger scale. So there is a flux of energy um, through the um, surface that separates the cloud from the environment. You cannot treat it as a separate, like like a planet or something like that. Okay, so people say that clouds are buffeted by interstellar shocks and stuff like that. Uh, so we can, uh, we can then zoom in from, we can consider volume uh, roughly of a size of this uh, thickness of this layer, the galactic disk scale height. And we can, uh, we, at this scale, we have a box of about 200 parsecs, uh, and we want to simulate um, uh, this turbulence as turbulence in the multi-phase gas, because at this scales, the temperatures uh, and cooling and heating matter. Uh, now, if we uh, define a cloud uh, within this cloud, we can simulate turbulence uh, using either thermal approximation. And so that is uh, the either thermal simulation example where the, the box size is about five parsecs. And then within this cloud, we can find uh, cores. And if our simulation is uh, uh, has uh, enough resolution, we can see that these cores are actually, uh, will not actually produce uh, individual stars, but instead they can produce uh, several different objects when these objects collapse, right? Uh, and so if we zoom in further, we can see what happens when, uh, when a star uh, forms here, okay? <clears throat> Uh, well, gravity certainly is involved in, in between here and there. But I can, I can claim that here gravity doesn't matter to some extent. So let, let me just uh, switch to the next slide, which will address this problem. So I, I talked a little bit about the larger scale turbulence. And so what we have here is an example of simple simulation in, uh, it's actually a three-dimensional uh, box, but very flat, 20 cells uh, in thickness, and then 4096 squared, uh, the rest. Uh, it uses a simple uh, numerical scheme, which is uh, pretty dissipative. But what you see is the evolution of one of those uh, spirals uh, created by uh, spiral potential, which is included. Uh, the model also includes self gravity, heating and cooling, and a little bit of chemistry. But what you see here is that this uh, nice spiral wave uh, would break into pieces, right? And then these pieces would uh, combine uh, <clears throat> Uh, they, they would start rotating and they would merge. So this is a signature of uh, perhaps uh, two-dimensional uh, inverse energy cascade. And there is no magnetic field in this case, okay? So there is no feedback here, of course, right? But we, we know that there is feedback. But we can see that, uh, <clears throat> oops. Okay, so let me. Uh, when you include feedback, the picture becomes uh, more complicated. But the same gravitational instabilities that you have seen in the previous slide operate here as well. It's just a combination of uh, different ways to inject energy into the ISM. So the energy is injected bo both by supernovae and by um, uh, large-scale gravitational instabilities that you, you've seen in the previous slide. Okay, now from fluid dynamics, we know that if the system is flat, 
and incompressible, then there will be a split en kinetic energy cascade. Part of the energy will cascade in a three-dimensional manner uh, down from the uh, uh, thickness of the disk, right, and, and part of the energy will go to larger scales to produce large-scale structures. Uh, this is completely, uh, this is a wide spot in, in this business. We, in astrophysics, we don't know much about it, but I think we need to study this because uh, uh, these effects of the inverse energy cascade can regulate the formation of uh, Merkel cloud complexes in particular rotation of GMCs, and uh, this, uh, this can in turn uh, change uh, our theories of star formation. Okay, so these are questions that can be addressed potentially by uh, studying this process in more detail. Okay, so let's now switch to multi-phase turbulence. So I'm returning back to this uh, uh, cartoon that shows different models. And so now I would like to talk about this turbulence in these larger boxes that allows us to, to <coughs> uh, get initial conditions for star formation. Okay, so these models will include um, uh, magnetic fields. So there is thermal pressure, there's a usual definition, then magnetic pressure, dynamic pressure. Everything will interact together. There will be no gravity here. And we will inject energy at large scales, uh, no matter what sources are uh, adding this energy to the ISM. It could be supernovae or large scale gravitational instabilities. Uh, and then we will follow what happens. How do we get molecular clouds formed? Do they look like real molecular clouds? Are we missing something here or not? Okay. So uh, formally, this is just a simple uh, compressible MHD system. And all you need to add is this forcing at large scales. Uh, we use an artificial forcing, which is solenoidal, which is easy to control. We know how to deal with it. And it's a term in the uh, equations, right? And then we have a combination of heating and cooling uh, standard for thermal instability to, to work its way through the ISM. So we assume that gamma is a constant. And it's, it's an important approximation. And then we use lambda of t in the form that corresponds to what uh, is back. Um, because you already have due to mechanical injection and because it's stirring. So is it crucial to, to have another source of heating? Oh, yes, it is crucial because you want to balance this cooling term in a certain way to get this uh, thermal instability developing, in correct, developing correctly. So this is part of our astrophysical uh, uh, astrophysics, right, which we don't want to uh, drop. Okay, so I will talk about a few models. I have done several of those. Uh, these are pretty low resolution, but they show qualitative results that are interesting, I think. So I have uh, cases A, B, and C star, uh, and they differ only in the A from B differs by the um, applied mean field, so which is three times smaller in this case. The truth for the local ISM is somewhere in between A and B. Now, uh, case C has the right uh, value of magnetic field, but it is driven by supernova feedback. Uh, and so this is work done by Paolo Padoan and uh, collaborators. Um, so it's, it's a very similar setting. So the box is a little bit larger, but instead of uh, this artificial uh, solenoidal forcing, he's using artificial supernova feedback. Okay, so we will look. So the box is, uh, uh, contains uh, either million uh, solar masses or maybe two million solar masses for this one. So what we do then is we take the cooling and heating uh, prescriptions from Volfire et al. And they fix this uh, uh, location of the thermal equilibrium in the um, phase diagram of thermal pressure versus density, right? And so this is famous uh, uh, instability. Uh, so this part of the equilibrium is unstable. 
and you have a cold <coughs> neutral medium in the range of temperatures in this model from uh, 194 to 18 Kelvin, and then warm uh, medium uh, at larger temperatures. And it's just a simple two-phase mo model in this case, right? Uh, we, um, we, we want to reproduce Larson's relation, uh, the scaling of the velocity of this uh, um, uh, length. Uh, and so in order to do that, we need to um, fix the, the uh, rate of energy injection in, in the system uh, to feed this, uh, the RMS velocity, roughly speaking, at large scales in the box. Then we want to check whether this model uh, will reprodu reproduce uh, the thermal pressure distribution which is observed um, and whether this will um, correctly capture the, the magnetic field properties in, in the range of densities um, uh, that, uh, that falls into this system. Okay, so let's see what we do. Uh, we, we take some initial perturbations, allow thermal instability to develop, and then we turn on forcing, and that's what happens after the forcing is, um, starts to work. We basically, we get, um, we get first transition, and then uh, we get to a statistical steady state. So you can think of the structures in the box as uh, large, uh, these are the densest pieces. You see they are all filamentary. They look like molecular clouds. So if we, um, if we compose a map of this, uh, it would look similar to the old, very uh, classical uh, 1987 map of uh, the uh, Perseus uh, region. And so you, you can look at the Isocontrous, they, they morphologically are very similar. <clears throat> okay, so you see a lot of filamentary structures. So this is uh, just volumetric rendering of density. Um, so that's where the, the cold and dense gas uh, is. We can also see how a magnetic field is organized in the system. Uh, there, there are very thin, very sharp dissipative structures. Uh, and uh, the, the highest magnetic field values uh, correspond to the highest density in the box, of course. And the structure of magnetic field in these molecular clouds is very erratic. Okay. So uh, that, uh, uh, these two plots show the evolution of uh, kinetic, magnetic, and thermal energies uh, in case A. So we start with some tiny perturbations. Uh, uh, then there is a phase transition happening up to this point. We get a little bit of uh, turbulence due to just uh, thermal instability itself. Then here we turn on uh, forcing and then eventually we get to a steady state, okay? So red is uh, total energy, blue and green are kinetic and uh, uh, magnetic energies. You see there is a green partition in this case uh, between kinetic and magnetic energy. And then uh, thermal energy gets a little boost from forcing and then also saturates uh, as a function of time. Uh, magnetic field in mod it cases A and B uh, starts from a uniform value and then uh, grows and then saturates. So these, uh, these thinner lines show what happens to the uh, fluctuations of magnetic field. And the thicker ones show what happens to the total. And you can see the proportion between the total and fluctuations, right? And so these are micro -gauss. Uh, we can also look how this uh, magnetic and kinetic energy are distributed uh, in terms of scale. So we compute uh, power spectra of those energies. 
And so here we recover the familiar picture from incompressible uh, simulations uh, with MHD. So where uh, magnetic energy is a little bit higher, just a factor of one point something, 1.5, uh, lower than two across scales, but otherwise they look like they are in, in, equip in detailed equipartition. Okay, case B has weaker um, mean field, and so the small scale dynamo makes its way through, through roughly this configuration, and then uh, it's, um, it stops um, building up a uh, large scale field. Okay. So the, uh, the phase diagram, again, this is thermal pressure versus uh, density, uh, is very useful to uh, look at if you want to understand what, how star formation works, actually. So um, this example shows case B with uh, intermediate magnetic field value. Um, this is initial conditions. That's the same thermal equilibrium curve. And so the isocontrols show how many uh, cells within our domain uh, belong to a given regime. So we see that uh, so most of the volume is filled with the warm phase. Uh, some of the volume, uh, about 7%, uh, uh, contains cold phase. And there is a lot of uh, thermally unstable gas in between those. Uh, and so you can look at this uh, numbers. So by volume, this is 23% uh, warm, 70% uh, unstable, and 7% cold. So this is roughly what we observe in the Milky Way. By mass, um, cold stuff uh, represents roughly one half. The rest, uh, the other half, is warm and unstable. So we are, we are getting roughly uh, what we want to get. Now, we don't have gravity here, but I can say that if you would add adaptive mesh on top of what we have in this uniform grid simulation, we would have to start refining, according to the true love criterion, uh, in these areas that belong uh, here. And so we can act actually estimate how much gas do we have to the right from this dashed line that uh, shows the criterion for gravitational instability. And we can, uh, we can see that uh, there is 0.1% of uh, volume fraction that would experience, that's where we would have to refine. So the, uh, because we expect star formation. And, and actually, our experience tells us that if we include gravity, then all, the, all of this gas will eventually collapse uh, into something with some uh, efficiency factor, of course. So this is the same diagram, but it is mass weighted. So it shows how much mass is available here. And so the number to the right from this dashed curve, this is the stuff that is gravitationally unstable, is 1.4%. So what we've done here, we uh, set up a model that mimics roughly local conditions at the solar radius of the Milky Way. And we get out of this very simple consideration the realistic uh, star formation rate if we believe in what uh, adaptive mesh would uh, produce, OK? Uh, now let's see how, how this model actually works. So we, we looked at these phase diagrams, but now we are looking at a collapsed version of this. We, we are looking at the uh, density PDF, right, as a function of time. So let's see what happens as uh, the system evolves. So uh, this is captured for about 30 mega years. So it's interesting that there is uh, only tiny little variations here, right? Uh, and this is a log normal that represents that high density tail. And so the system uh, evolves basically around this log normal. and doesn't move much. You see, this is 10 to the minus 7. So there is some movement between 
minus 5 and minus 7, but the rest of it is nearly stationary. So the star formation process, which depends on how much mass you have to the right from some critical value, is, is not changing much. So that 1.5% uh, uh, star formation rate per freefall time um, is a good number. It doesn't change. It doesn't vary much. Okay. So now, just to entertain you, I show the same um, phase diagram, but for the three-phase model with, with supernovae driving. Okay. Uh, you can see that this is what we were modeling with solenoidal driving. This is the just two phases, warm and cold, right? Now, because of this uh, solenoid, uh, supernova driving, we, we get the hot phase. And the temperatures here go up to 10 to the 7 and more. But the volume filled with this gas from supernovae is small. It oscillates uh, crazily during the run. Uh, but it, it uh, gets from 1% to 20% or something like that by volume. Okay. Now let's see how this picture looks like. So this run has gravity actually, right? So um, if you ignore the fringes, so this blue stuff is where you have just one zone in this regime, right? So you can ignore the, the, um, the fringes of this diagram. And you can say, see immediately that the bulk, this red stuff, stays where it is uh, sitting uh, without any um, motion, right? And you see uh, how, um, how this uh, high density end fits the star formation, right? The, so this, this simulation actually produces sink particles. And there are thousands of stars. Uh, uh, born in, in, uh, by the end of this uh, run. So this, uh, the, the time span here, though, is, is pretty short. It's just three uh, mega years, OK, once again. So I think this, uh, what we see here reinforces this simple idea that uh, it's a classical case of uh, pipeline. So you need to deliver gas to high densities, right, to initiate star formation. And the delivery process is mainly determined by the level of turbulence here and by the um, mean density of the gas in the box. And that is it. Gravity just takes the mass out. Doesn't change much in this uh, business. Okay, hot phase it helps to deliver energy from supernovae, but it is not involved directly. So the problem of star formation maybe is uh, more simple than we might think it is. Okay, so now this is the PDF of density again. It's uh, the collapsed uh, phase diagram, so that we just see the density dependence. Uh, and, and we can run a movie as a function of time. So what you see here is the, the previous piece of log normal. It does not approximate anything on this slide, but it shows that the full model with supernovae and self-gravity still coincides near the peak, right? Then because we have self-gravity, we have this little piece of uh, power law, which is produced by cell gravitating gas. OK, so this, uh, this is expected, and we can theoretically predict the slope. Uh, then it goes a little down because the resolution is limited. This is just 1,000 cubed. It's not enough to get the whole tail correctly. OK, so let's see how this evolves. Once again, there is a lot of activity due to supernovae uh, here in the low density regime. But at least for three mega years, this part stays put. Nothing, nothing is happening. So it's, it looks like it's a very, even, even the tail is not moving much, right? So it looks like simple models without much care about intermittency would reproduce the, the observed uh, <clears throat> things. OK, now we have different parameters in this model. So for example, we can modify the mean density. 
Then this uh, will change, um, so smaller 2.5 times smaller mean density in the box will shrink the phase diagram so that there is nearly nothing available for star formation, okay? So if you have in your disk a region with low density for some reason due to some large scale processes, they will shut the star formation off, right? You can also, uh, <clears throat> uh, change the turbulent velocity level. For example, you have region with a smaller RMS velocity. Then the, the diagram will be different again, but there will be a long nose crossing this line of gene's uh, stability. And so <clears throat> the volume fraction will be small, but there will be a high, pretty high mass fraction. So there will be 7.1 percent the star formation rate um, per free fall time, okay? So you can see how this simple uh, three-parameter model can describe different regimes, right? Uh, what I'm not discussing here is what happens when we uh, change gamma, the, the heating rate. It can also be different in different places in the disk, right? And so this gamma translates into moving the uh, the um, <clears throat> equilibrium curve up and down along the uh, isotherms. So it would shift and then the, 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 uh, the diagram would have to adjust to this new position of thermal equilibrium, okay? So this is the pressure distribution that we get from cases A and B and it's a huge, right? It's six orders of magnitude. We can never see that in the real ISM because we we mask some of the regions, right? And when we unmask, when we mask the way observations tell us we have to mask, right? Uh, we ignore everything that, is, uh, that has more column density than 2.5, 10 to the 21 centimeters uh, to the power of minus one. And so we then get very nice correspondence to the observational data from HST. Uh, <coughs> archival data. So we, we put three parameters in, we get a nice distribution, right? So it, it has the right shape. Uh, this, these points do not, do not, do not uh, help though. Okay, so we can reproduce uh, the uh, first Larsen's relationship. So this is the essentially the blue line. So we do statistical analysis of velocities in the cold phase. We get the right uh, slope, um, uh, which is shown here. Okay. We uh, capture most of the points from uh, a for H1, uh, from De Crutcher's work here. Uh, unfortunately, the density without adaptive mesh uh, ends up right there, so we cannot talk much about these points, but we have uh, adaptive mesh simulations that actually cover this region as well. So it looks like magnetic field is good. Um, we can uh, think what happens, whether, um, whether um, we, we can reproduce the um, uh, energy equipartition, so for example, uh, this is uh, a scatter plot of uh, uh, magnetic pressure versus dynamic pressure. You see that the pressure is, uh, um, the, the mean is roughly here, so this means that there is energy equipartition. So this is consistent. I call this uh, beta turbulent and it's about one. So now the question, where do we have molecular clouds in this world? So where would they be? And so the answer is very simple. They lie in the corner. And so turbulent beta for molecular clouds is 30, which means that kinetic energy strongly dominates. Why is it so? And so that means that turbulence regime in molecular clouds is actually super, um, uh, super alphenic, right? Uh, yes. So kinetic energy dominates by a large margin over uh, uh, magnetic energy. Why this is happening? That's because the warm phase which produces molecular clouds is subalphenic. 
which means that velocities are well aligned with the field lines. And so the, the gas gets squeezed, but the magnetic field is not amplified sufficiently. Okay? And this is all um, uh, consistent with observations, of course. Now, if you look at the uh, normal plasma beta, which is the ratio of uh, the um, um, a thermal pressure to magnetic, we see that magnetic pressure dominates, and so that's where we are. Um, okay, so this is another way to look at the uh, super aliphatic nature of uh, dense gas, which is everything above 100 particles per cc. So most of this is uh, super aliphatic. And so we, we come up with a very simple model that reproduces basic observational properties of this multiphase ISM uh, locally. Okay. Uh, I think I have uh, some time, right? Five, like five minutes. So let me, let me then uh, switch to this uh, application to CMB foregrounds. I just have a few slides. Uh, left here. So um, there was this uh, um, need to understand the thermal dust foregrounds uh, to, in order to uh, single out the CMB signal in what we see uh, uh, with Planck, for example, right? And so uh, the signal is here, and there are two important foregrounds related to galactic emis dust emission, right? Uh, so this is thermal galactic dust, and this is synchrotron. And so you see they cross each other, and they destroy the actual thing that we want. So we want to understand what, how do we um, detach the thermal dust, how we uh, subtract it to get the actual uh, blue uh, think we, we are interested in. And so related to that is uh, you can also, you can use thermal dust emission because dust gets aligned with magnetic field um, to, to map the large scale magnetic field in the Milky Way, right? So that's the, that's the famous map. And then <clears throat> you want to subtract this and see what is the structure of the actual CMB field. Right, and so in order to do that, you you uh, you have to mask parts of the sky, and so this gray uh, mask uh, kills the signal that is in the uh, Milky Way disk. But then there are there are uh, there is black, uh, blue, dark blue, red, and and so on uh, things that <clears throat> progressively go to the galactic poles. And so he, right here, the signal should be more related to CMB and less to the galactic contamination. And uh, you can measure the uh, uh, power loss related to this power spectra of E and B modes, right? In different uh, regions on that previous uh, slide map, and so you see that the, uh, the power indices are lying in the range around minus 2.4. And you can also look at the ratio of the power in E and B modes uh, uh, in this uh, galactic emission measured by Planck. And so this ratio is about 0.52, I think, 0.52, right? Uh, and again, this each point corresponds to a specific mask uh, in the two slides before. So the question is, uh, we have this beautiful MHD simulation with uh, 200 parsec box, right? Can we reproduce these results? If we just look through this box, that's roughly what we are doing. The claim was that we are, uh, the box is good for local ISM. So can we check this? Okay. So that's, that's the answer. So what we do here, we use the mask the same way. So we don't include pix voxels in the box that have density above 70 centimeters uh, to the minus three. 
Uh, so this is molecular clouds. Nobody observes through molecular clouds the CMB. So we exclude those. And so what we get is uh, the power spectrum index minus 2.4. And we get E to B ratio. For some reason, I'm uh, inverting this. Instead of 0.50, uh, the B to E is 0.52, right? So we get, so this is uh, the Planck result. Uh, so we get roughly 1.92, which is uh, uh, the inverted uh, 0.52, right? OK, so it looks like the model, uh, of course, these scales are affected by dissipation. This is our forcing here. But this, uh, this region is uh, very limited because the simulations don't have enough dynamic range. Are you producing roughly the Planck observation uh, <clears throat> in the relevant uh, range of scales? Okay. We can uh, mask a little bit more. Instead of 70, we move to 50. And so the spectrum gets steeper, minus 2.6. And this, uh, <clears throat> the ratio gets a little bit higher um, than, than in previous case. So we can also plot uh, synthetic dust polarization maps. So the, this texture here basically reproduces the geometry of the plane of sky magnetic field. And uh, the, uh, the pseudo vectors show the direction of um, polarization. OK. So that is my summary for this part. And I think I need to stop. And it's time to. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, summarize for us exactly how you're, you're in the molecular cloud simulation. You're putting in turbulence continuously. Yes. Yes. This, if you this is. That description, what happens? This is driven. So if we change, we, we are losing then this. Uh, we are talking always about a statistical steady state yeah. where we can accumulate statistics and our spectra, everything looks good reliable. Uh, if we stop uh, pumping energy, then uh, the thing will decay. Turbulence will decay. And eventually the whole thing has to collapse. And everything will co be collapsing. Yes, yes. That's, that's true, yeah. It's a completely different problem, but we can do this as well. Yes. But in reality, one doesn't know. In reality, it's always happens. boiling. It's, um, that's that's where I started from. So, given molecular cloud, what is it? How long does it live? This is old. Um, I mean, this is things that we read read in textbooks. <laughs> so, um, so there is a, this question. So, um, if you have a molecular cloud and turbulence is within it, right? Uh, the turbulence decay time roughly is the, the cloud crossing time. And so that, that's it, right? So turbulence within clouds should decay. So the simple point of view does not take into consideration the flux of kinetic energy that constantly uh, comes down to this cloud from larger scales. That's, that's how turbulence works. It's just all about energy transfer. If you isolate the cloud from surroundings, then it will decay and collapse. But you cannot do that. So the bottom line is how this whole process fits into uh, a real Exactly. Exactly. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. So can you go back to the slide where you explain the effect of changing the heating um, on the stuff measuring? OK. Uh, which slow? Uh... You want this? Yeah, so when you, so when you increase the heating, then the, the whole curve goes up. 
or up and right, up to the right? Yeah, if, if the heating is increased, the whole line, it will have the same shape, mm -hmm. but it will just move oh, this so way. So there would be, if I have to this figure correctly, then there would be um, more, there would be more mass that uh, satisfies the genes. Right, 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 right. So you increase the heating and you have more star formation rate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is kind of, kind Run of away. Oh. I, so what's strange to me is that in order to form stars, you need to get rid of energy. Now we're saying that you, get, you increase the amount of energy that enters the system, and somehow the, uh, uh, you get more, more uh, clumps to, co to collapse. So this, is, this, is kind of, this is kind of counterintuitive. For me. It depends on how, where, where this thing goes. So um, actually, um, it's not so tri it's not trivial. Um, I have a movie which shows what happens to to the uh, diagram when the, the thing shifts. Uh, I can show it to you after. Um, maybe that will help to clarify this issue. Uh, I honestly I don't remember. It's my old paper, uh, like like uh, 15 years ago. <laughs> I forget things. Yeah. Okay. So just to follow up on uh, the end of Chris's question, um, if, like you say, what matters is the connection to the larger scale and the energy from larger scale turbulence, um, that presumably is still true for the boxes that you've simulated. So if you were to go to a larger scale, and you'd have a larger context to connect right, right, to the point where you start right, to do a right, galactic simulation. Right, right. Um, so on the larger scales, when you have the most massive molecular clouds, how confident can you be about the conclusions you're drawing on the ones that you've simulated, like the beta turf and the explanation for it? Right. So this is uh, an area where we don't have enough knowledge. It's, uh, the question is very good. Um, uh, I can tell you that um, the, the choice of 200 parsec box, so 250, it doesn't matter. Um, is exactly for this reason. So we, we know that this is the scale from which the, the cascade goes one way, right? But there is a possibility that is discussed in the literature that from this same scale, there is uh, another part of the cascade that goes to larger scales. And so this, uh, how this thing would regulate the cloud rotation patterns at larger scales is not clear at the moment, I think. But, but what we model with this um, kinetic energy injection with artificial force is the input of energy that would all go to, to smaller scales. 